All right. Hello and welcome. I can hear myself. Let's see how that goes. Flip around here. Okay, I get myself situated. I like that that sunrise. I don't know how much of the the kind of intro people watched, but um, it was very pretty. Fifteen minutes of the sun coming up. So I mentioned this in the excuse me in the chat, but I am in a SR twenty two, um, and kind of looking at a oh, got a thumbs up from the wife. Thank you, wife. And looking at about a seven o'clock liftoff time. So that's where I'm at. I saw a couple of planes floating around here. Let's see how they. Here when I start pulling forward. All right. So, why don't we do this? I'm gonna get the takeoff roll. Well, actually, I'm gonna do the intro to the stream real quick because uh, the flight plan itself uh, takes a little bit of time if you go all the way to Seattle. Um, but getting actually up to the mountain is, is pretty quick. So, uh, all right. So a little bit of information about the stream while everyone's getting settled. So each week we pick a new national park to explore together, and this week we're exploring Mount Rainier National Park. Uh, for those of you with a copy with Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020, I've uploaded the flight plan for you today to follow along. And I've also, uh, there's another link that'll be going up, I post those two real quick, another link that goes up that has the uh, background. If you'd like to watch where I'm flying but don't have Microsoft Flight Simulator, that's another option. So a couple of links in here for you. There's the flight plan. Uh, this is my settings and uh, flying singer and uh, ASU Sun Devil. You mentioned a couple of times that it's useful to have that kind of um, airplane information ahead of time. So let me know. Um, I can start maybe including that in the flight plan itself, actually, if that's a useful idea. Um, either shoot me a message here or in Discord afterwards, and that would be something I can do uh, in the future. So, like I said, we're flying an SR 22. This happens to be one of my favorite kind of plane. Nice low wing plane, fast one, too. All right, so um, like I mentioned, I've researched the park in preparation and added any new information with sources to the National Park Wikipedia page. Why Wikipedia? So there's two reasons. It's a way to make sure the facts are checked by others, and it's a way to give back to a living body of knowledge that goes beyond our hour here together. So to that end, if you notice anything that's incorrect or could be better clarified, please help fix the Wikipedia pages. As the wiki community often says, be bold and make the updates. Yes, please. Flying Singer says, okay. So yes, please. I think it's useful. Thanks. Okay, great. So I <laughs> double thumbs up. Let me make a note actually in my, my show notes real quick. i uh, got the double thumbs up that I should be doing. Include the takeoff time in the planes. So that's a great one. I can add that in next time. Um, okay, cool. Uh, you may have picked up on this already, but I try to pick at least one area to improve each week. So each week something uh, something new changes or gets added or gets hopefully gets improved is the goal. Um, so that might be next week. I'll start start putting those in. Okay, so Wikipedia. Uh, the other thing to know, we'll vote near the end of the uh, stream on the next National Park we want to explore together. So be on the lookout for that in the chat. And then also other questions or thoughts you have, feel free to post them in the chat as we go. And um, I love talking about the parks, happy to talk about anything. Small disclaimer, yes, I am a pilot, uh, but we'll be taking full advantage of this being a simulator. So please don't try this in real life. Without further ado, I'm Jules Altus, and I'll be your pilot for this evening. So sit back, relax, and let's explore Mount Rainier National Park. And with that, now let's do our takeoff roll, what do you say? Okay. Just give me just a moment here. Okay, great. Oh, actually, I was going to show something. So this is maybe useful, maybe not, but this is how I set up my autopilot. Um, so for those of you who are flying the same plane, if this is something of, of value, at least you have it, then I'll turn up the brightness on some of these. So I'm switching over to using the GPS for navigation. And then I go and switch over to nav mode on. I'm going to leave the autopilot disengaged for now so I can just set everything up. And then I'll have it be a vertical speed mode. But before I do that, I'm actually going to set it so I have my altitude. Um, and so what it's going to do is it'll continue increasing altitude until it hits a particular altitude. And so I'm actually going for 1,000, uh, 1,500, excuse me, 15,000, <laughs> 15,000. Why is it? Oh, it's, I'm doing the outside dial. That's why I felt like it was taking forever. Uh, the inner dial does hundreds, the other does thousands. Okay. 
great. So now it'll stop once I hit 15,000. And then I'm going to have my vertical speed be about, we'll go 800. I was flying at, uh, we'll go 900. I was flying at 1,000, and the plane uh, kind of got to a point of stalling periodically. So, all right, turn that down, turn this down. And then we'll hit that autopilot button once we're in the air and fly that. Okay. And away we go. This is kind of an interesting runway. It has a bit of a curve to it, but the takeoff at the end is right over a nice lake, which I really enjoyed. I actually did quite a, f quite a few takeoffs at night out here, and the, the shoreline is all kind of lit up with all these little cabins. Pretty enjoyable way to do it. I'll show you the outside here. Get myself flying up here. Okay, so Mount Rainier. Uh, oh, a couple administrative updates actually while I get myself sort of situated and, and on my flight path. Um, music at the beginning is by Howard Harper Burns, same fella as, as before. Uh, highly recommend it if you like that style of music. Um, the other administrative update and kind of the thing that I worked on for this week is the YouTube videos are public. So if you search Tools Altus on YouTube, then you can go and watch any of the old uh, well, right now only three of them are up, but I'll, I'll put up more of them as I, as I get more time on it. So good to be aware. All right, and let me turn off my lights. Let's get our autopilot going here. All right, so now hopefully we have a very easy flight here. So Mount Rainier National Park. And Fractals mentioned he may be uh, preoccupied this evening, so I'll do both sides of this, which happens to work out very well because I played a bunch with the autopilot, so I actually have a, a good sense for that. So I'll post up this first poll here. Have you ever been to the National Park? Yeah, yes in the last 10 years. Yes, uh, once upon a time, or not yet. Well, people are responding to that one. So the purpose of Mount Rainier National Park, this is the park purpose statement from the foundation document. The purpose of Mount Rainier National Park is to protect and preserve unimpaired the majestic icon of Mount Rainier, which you can see off in the distance already. So let me pop out of the plane. There's Mount Rainier, Columbia Crest. Uh, the purpose of the park is to protect and preserve unimpaired the majestic icon of Mount Rainier, a glaciated volcano, along with its natural and cultural resources, values, and dynamic processes. The park provides opportunities for people to experience, understand, and care for the park environment and also provides for wilderness experiences and sustained wilderness values. That's what Mount Rainier is all about. And we will have a beautiful view as we fly up to it. For those of you who have been to Seattle before, you'll probably remember it as visible from the city. Uh, but it is uh, a tall mountain and one of the tallest, I think it's the tallest in the Cascade Range, or at least in the United States. So it's a very pretty icon to go and see. All right, let's see, I believe this is results. Maybe that's not how I do that one. Do a quick uh, up search, nope, okay. That's fine. Uh, wife, do you happen to remember the command to, to post results? No, okay, she says no. <laughs> that's all right. Um, let me do this. I have a backup plan. So I have not been to Mount Rainier National Park. Um, and so it looks like I am in the... Oh, it looks like it's not loading at all. Oh, maybe straw pull is down. Oof. Okay. Well, that's too bad. Um, we'll roll a little bit. That's fine. So uh, park purpose. We talked a little bit about the, the park. The... Uh, no problem, we didn't need results. Thanks, man with swim girl. Min girl, excuse me. I always read that as swim, by the way, which I think is kind of funny. Um, so there are, uh, we talked about the park purpose. There's a number of actually really good videos by the park. So if you're looking for some some fun, lazy watching on a, on a weekend, 
the Mount Rainier playlists are really good on YouTube. I found a nice one about the park that I'll pull up later, but what I'm thinking we do, just like with Hawaii, it's one of those videos that is more engaging after you've learned a couple of the, the topics that we're going to talk about. So I think I'll hold that till the end, uh, and then we'll finish today's stream with uh, the park video. Which means we get to launch right into Person of the Week. So this week, let me do a quick pan around here so I don't forget. We have a bunch of really cool mountains off in the distance here. Nope, Flying Singer, ASU Sun Devil. I think I am cruising well past you. All right. So person of the week is William McKinley. So why William McKinley for this park? So on March 2nd of 1899, President William McKinley signed a bill passed by Congress authorizing the creation of Mount Rainier National Park. And it was the nation's fifth national park at the time. So he's the one who signed the bill to create this park. I recognize him from his photo. Good old black and white. So William McKinley was born in 1843, lived till 1901, and he was the 25th president of the United States. Uh, he served as president from, at the very end of his life, from 1897 until 1901, and he was a president who was assassinated in office. So his, um, that's why his presidency ends at the same time. During his presidency, McKinley led the nation to a victory in the Spanish-American War, raised protective tariffs to promote American industry, and kept the nation on the gold standard in rejection of the expansion, ex, expansionary monetary policy of free silver. So he kept us on the gold standard. His presidency was marked by rapid economic growth. He uh, promoted the 1897 uh, Dingley Tariff to protect manufacturers and factory workers uh, from foreign competition, and in 1900 secured the passage of the Gold Standard Act. So those are kind of the, the detailed pieces of, of what he just did, or what he did during his presidency. He also helped persuade Spain to grant independence to their rebellious Cuba without any native, without any conflict. Um, or sorry, he hoped to persuade them to do this. Uh, but when negotiation failed, he led the nation into the Spanish-American War in 1898. And the United States' victory there was quick and decisive. Also, as part of that peace settlement coming out of the, the Spanish-American War, um, sorry, I totally lost. Uh, as part of that peace settlement, uh, Spain turned over a number of overseas colonies to the United States, so colonies like Puerto Rico, Guam, the Philippines, and then Cuba was promised independence, um, but at the time remained under the U.S. Army control. It also, uh, yeah, so that's, uh, during that piece, uh, a bunch of those countries uh, ended up joining the United States, like the Puerto Rico being a, a notable one. Uh, historians regard McKinley as his victory as realigning the election um, after a sort of political stalemate that was going on in the post-Civil War era. So that led into a, a new progressive era, they called it. And then he won again in uh, 1900 and then was shot in 1901. He died eight, lays, eight days later and was uh, succeeded by President, Vice President, then President Theodore Roosevelt. So as an innovator of American in interventionism and a pro-business sentiment, Mc, uh, McKinley is generally ranked above average as far as presidents goes. His highly public, highly positive public perception was soon overshadowed by that of Roosevelt. So he was a good president, uh, generally regarded well, uh, and then followed up by Roosevelt, who was regarded even better. So that's a, a tough act to follow. All right, so William McKinley. So our first topic for the day, and I'll kind of pan around a little bit again. I typically will fly these streams, actually, what's called stick and rudder. And so what that means is not using any autopilot and just... Um, I'm using a controller, so not really like a plane, but um, but the idea being that you're flying it by hand. So it's a, a lot more stable, but if it's uh, visually less interesting, uh, feel free to let me know. That would be really good feedback for the, the post afterwards as I play with the autopilot a little bit more. All right, so first topic today is lichens. So let me post up the poll here. And we'll do the poll, and if we can't uh, get the poll results out, then we will uh, we'll make it work. But I like the polls because they kind of bring a bunch of these things together. Okay. Ah, got it. That's how I do it. Okay. We got the poll command good. All right. So what is a lichen, or a lichen, as it's also called? 
Is it a style of British kitchen that is designed around a central lamp? Lichen. Or, it's not quite as strong as a love note, it's just a, a lichen note. Or, is it a simple community of at least two mutually, uh, mutually dependent organisms, fungi and green algae? Give people a second to vote on that one. So connection to the park. There's over 500 different species of lichen, and I'll say lichen, by the way, uh, lichen is a British pronunciation for it, an alternate pronunciation, so, uh, but I'll say lichen. There are over 500 different species of lichen in Mount Rainier National Park. Uh, plus, at least for me, when I think Pacific Northwest, uh, lichens come to mind right away. And if you haven't seen them or, or it's not connecting what those are, you've seen them around actually in a couple of other national parks. So this is uh, a lichen. These uh, kind of spots on here are lichens growing on petrified wood in Petrified Forest National Park. So we were just there a couple weeks ago. There's another one from Acadia. So this is now several weeks back. It's another kind of lichen. This is a little bit more kind of leafy looking. Or this is another one from Acadia. This is called Old Man's Beard out of the tree and there's a really famous set of lichen that you may recognize from yosemite and so off in the distance that kind of uh they call it vertical paint on the uh, mountain face is all lichens so that's what gives it that black color on half dome very famous sort of place where you see lichens actually the lichens in yosemite are famous in general um, but especially on half dome all right let's see Oops. Okay. Results. All right. Hey, that worked. Visual, thank you. Okay. <laughs> our our watchers are, are all flying. Okay, so the uh, the correct answer for this one is maybe the obvious one which is a it's a simple community of at least two mutually dependent organisms fungi and green algae and so the other two are sort of uh jokes just to remember the pronunciation all right here we are coming up to the park so we are pretty well zoomed in here so we'll actually do kind of a, a spiral pattern today and so we'll see all sides of the mountain a couple of times over change something up real quick so my angle of attack is real this is the tricky part of mounted flying right, that should help a lot okay so a lichen a lichen is a simple community of mutually dependent organisms specifically a fungi and green algae so the green algae uh, uses a photosynthesis process to produce food for the fungus while the fungus protects the algae from the elements and extracts nutrients from soil and rock so that's sort of uh Symbiotic relationship. It's a classic example of a symbiotic relationship. The lichen structure is more uh, elaborate and durable than either the fungus or the algae alone. When organisms of different species are dependent on each other uh, and benefit from each other's activity, then it's called a mutually uh, symbiotic, a mutualistic symbiotic relationship. Okay. Hold on a second. I got to tend to the plane. This is the other problem with not flying stick and rudder. Oh, I know what's going on. There we go. All right, quick check in on my autopilot. I think that'll work. All right. Okay, so uh, symbiosis in lichens is so well balanced that lichens have been considered a relatively self-contained contained miniature ecosystem in and of themselves so just a single lichen is its own little ecosystem it's a full ecosystem they also have properties that are different from other organisms so they're not plants although they're sort of plant-like sometimes um, they're really their own thing they're uh, a symbiotic relationship is what they're called so they superficially can look like moss. You saw a couple photos a little bit ago, but they're not. They're not related to moss. It's not related to any plants. They don't have roots uh, like plants would do. Um, however, they do produce nutrients through photosynthesis like a plant would. So you get a little bit of, of both sides of that um, in the lichen. All right. 
<laughs> hey, Fractals, no worries. I figured out how to do uh, straw poll results in the chat. Um, so it worked out fine. Um, OK, so what types of lichen are there? There's basically three types that you, you'll encounter in any kind of given point. Oh, actually, let me do a quick pause real quick, because the side of the mountain is beautiful. The view backwards is beautiful. And while we're here, so what I'm going to do is actually set the plane out. Let's see if we're going to make this top. We should be OK. We'll go low, but um, so let me show what this looks like. This is the view if you were flying in. So that's like actually the summit. So we approach the summit. And then this is the, uh, the crest itself, the part that we're flying up to right now. Flip back over here. Hopefully the plane will uh, start making its own turn here. Hey, look at that. Autopilot's so cool. Just don't want to fly that close to a mountain. Right. Cool. So uh, ASU Sun Devil and Flying Singer, what I'm going to do next is I'm going to set my uh, autopilot to descend about uh, 500 feet a minute, and then I'm going to have the altitude stop at 8,000. So if you're also using autopilot, those work pretty well for me. If not, then whatever works. Okay, and turn on vertical speed. Okay. All right, and then pull back the throttle a little bit. Because if you descend with full throttle, you are you'll go very very fast. We don't want to do that. All right, hopefully that works. So there's incredible views of all the mountains all around. And we just passed just over on our left here. It's called Steamboat Prow, so it's right off my tail. I can, if my mouse shows up or not. It's like, yeah, right there. That's Steamboat Prow. I will pass it by again. I'll show you a picture, but just to, to kind of see that one. So this is what it looks like in in real life, it kind of splits this glacier into two different glaciers. And the other one is Little Taho uh, Tahoma, and that is this um, mountain that we just passed over. So flip back, it's right off my tail there. Two really famous ones, especially if you're going to, to summit the mountain. And I believe the highest camp, I think it's called Camp Mirror. Yeah, there you go. Um, as in Muir Woods and uh, and all the other times we talked about uh, John Muir. That's the, the camp that you can stay at if you're going to go up and climb the top, which he did, by the way. Okay. Now we get to spiral around, spiral around excuse me, beautiful Mount Rainier. Okay, so uh, lichens. Three different types that you'll encounter, typically. There's the folios, the fruity Coast, fruticose, and the crustos. Um, and all three of them in a single picture, it's not a great example, but it's a pretty good example. And so you can see the uh, crustose sort of flat. Uh, folios looks a little bit more like leaves. And then the fruticose has this sort of like three-dimensional structure to it. And I'll pull up photos of all three of those. So like I said, folios, get the leaves. And then the fruticose, that three-dimensional structure something like that and then the one that i encounter most of the time uh, at least in the part of the country i'm in is is the crustos or cr uh crustios excuse me i wrote out crustos yeah um and so these kind of look flat they lay kind of along the side of a rock and you can see they have these beautiful colors to them uh, i was actually out walking with my wife just before the live stream we did a, a walk around the neighborhood and i was ex i'm i have had a lot of people tell me that lichens are their favorite animal not animal um their favorite organism and i'd never really understood why uh until researching this week and now they're one of my favorite animals too i mean i'm definitely definitely a fan at this point hey there asu sun devil looking good no why my altitude seems to be much higher than yours i didn't calibrate oh 
Yeah, I didn't. That's not good. Uh, my flight instructor would be so sad. Okay, don't tell him. Um, so Sun Devil was reporting uh, much higher, or much higher altitude than mine, but mine was miscalibrated, which actually is a problem in, if you're out flying real like, but that's okay. Uh, okay, so three types of uh, lichens. Um, there's actually a, quite a few more, but the lines between them all are pretty fuzzy, and those three are the main ones you're going to encounter anyway, so we'll stay with those. All right, so I mentioned it's a sy symbiotic relationship. This is probably the most helpful picture to understanding what's going on here. So you have a bunch of different layers, A through E. The first layer is called the cortex, and it's this outer layer of tightly woven fungus filaments. So that's that protective layer that we talked about. Then there's the uh, photosynthesizing green algae in this layer here, and so that's where it gets that the nutrients from the sun. Underneath that, there's loosely packed fungus filaments, and then a tightly another tightly woven layer uh, of the lower cortex, similar to the top one. And then finally, it has some sort of like anchoring fungus filaments. So this is how it would attach to like a rock or whatever it's going to attach to. So when we talk about a lichen, this is the picture to have in your head. It's this sort of like, or at least a type of lichen. There's a bunch of different variations, but um, is this sort of algae working with the fungus and together then they're able to, uh, to survive better. Uh, lichen in general have an estimated, cover an estimated of 6 to 8% of the Earth's land surface. So 6 to 8% of the entire world is covered by lichens, land surface. They occur anywhere from sea level to high alpine elevations, Mount Rainier being a, a great example of that kind of environment. They are abundant, um, growing on bark and leaves, moss, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, okay, they, sorry. They, basically, lichens grow everywhere. So they grow on, on bark. We shot a picture on a petrified wood. Uh, I found some rocks outside when I was walking with my wife and pointed them out. Um, if you are walking past a pack a patch of rocks in your neighbor's yard or in your yard, uh, and you go look at it and you see the little um, kind of colors or pattern, that's probably a lichen. Um, so they're incredibly easy to find. Um, they'll grow on roofs, walls, uh, rubber, soil crusts, all sorts of areas. They're also adapt to extreme environments. So they can survive uh, the Arctic tundra, hot dry deserts, rocky coasts, um, toxic areas. They can even live inside of a rock. So this is a kind of lichen who the actual body of the lichen is inside. And the only part that inside the, the rock, like the grains of the rock itself, it's inside. The only part that you see exposed is um, kind of the reproductive organs when it, uh, I don't think it's not called flowering, but it's sort of like these um, uh, fruiting bodies, excuse me, fruiting bodies are the only piece that you see, and that's just for reproduction. The rest of the, the lichen is inside. Crazy little critter. Not critter. Crazy not critter. Uh, color, we've seen a bunch of different colors on these. They can go reds, oranges, browns, um, especially in dry habitats. You get this sort of like mosaic of different colors. They have this special pigment that they can pick up depending on the lichen. If they don't have any pigments, then they're typically bright green to olive gray uh, when they're wet, and then they'll turn grayish or green-brown when they're dry. The reason for that, uh, actually we'll talk about why that is in just a moment. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, okay, so so the reason for that is that the um, surface layer, that cortex, will become more transparent when it's wet, which reveals a greener layer below, so it opens up for more photosynthesis when it's wet which is, of course, the exact time you'd want more waters when you're actually going to be using it to produce food. And so in that way, it can be protected most of the time. And then when it rains, it uh, kind of the cortex allows more light in, allows more, um, more uh, resources in. And so then uh, it can produce food at that at that time. Yeah, sailor guy for sure. It's nature's painting. Yeah, and, and actually the best photos I found of it were people doing... Um, artwork because you can just paint with lichens so. okay do a quick side break on the park so uh we love oh we talked about steamboat brow that's okay actually we'll get to sunrise first and then we'll go from there so right up where asu sun devil is uh, just a little before that actually kind of in the the snow pack there is the Paradise, I'm sorry, the Sunrise Inn um, uh, Visitor Center. So you can see it kind of on the map here. 
This is also where you can drive to this point if you wanted to go and see. So you'll see actually the roads carving up along the sides of a lot of these mountains. So this is where you would go if you were going to see um, that part of the park. And they'll have some better videos of, of what this looks like in the, that video at the end I mentioned. Uh, okay, a little bit more about lichens. So they are incredibly long-lived, some of the oldest living organisms around. It's also hard to call them uh, like what counts as still alive, because if uh, lichen breaks in half and one half keeps growing because it's just a bundle of fungus and algae, like is it the same lichen still, or how does that work? But in general, they live a very, very long time. Uh, they also have a slow and regular growth rate. And sometimes it's so regular that you can use it to, uh, to date different artifacts. So if you know the growth rate of the lichen, you can actually figure out how long something has been around because the lichen patterns are so obvious. So for instance, if you look at this kind of lichen, you'll see a lichen that's been growing steadily and then the inside's dying, but the outside's continuing to just grow. You'll see this is the spelling of um, folios. People are curious. Uh, lichens have been have a long fossil record. We talked about fossil record back in Petrified and uh, Forest National Park. So they have been in the fossil record back 2.2 billion years. Incredibly long amount of time. Like I mentioned, when a new lichen is going to be formed, it can reproduce asexually, so it just piece breaks off. Um, or it can release uh, diaspores, um, which is just a few algae, uh, algal cells, excuse me, surrounded by fungal cells. So just have a little bit of uh, kind of a start. Um, also, when they dry out, they can break into fragments, and those broken up fragments will uh, can get blown away in the, rain, the wind, and then as soon as they get moisture again, they can start growing. Very clever way to go. Actually, they're, they're survivors in a lot of senses, so they're considered a pioneer species, and so they'll be the first living things to start growing on bare rock, or areas inundated, uh, sorry, or other areas that have been kind of uh, uh, harmed by some kind of disaster. So this is one... Um, actually, pioneer species are, are really interesting, and we talked about another one in another park. Is there any others that that folks in the chat like pioneer species you you see or or you've encountered around? Um, the one that comes to mind for me is when Hawaii volcanoes. We talked about Ohia Lahua, and that's the plant that most often comes in right after a volcano erupts, and so that's sort of like you know what's the first plant to move into an area that has no that can't sustain life and then how does it do it i love that kind of kind of thing so i'd be curious if others have a pioneer species that you know of or are interesting kind of fun uh fun ones to think through so i mentioned that uh lichens are a pioneer species it's also that they're very good at surviving uh, periods of drought or periods of extreme environments um they can Essentially, if they lose all the water in their body, then once they get uh, water back, then they can just um, reconstitute themselves and, and start photosynthesizing again. So it, it's a very uh, good survival mechanism for the lichens. It's so effective, actually, that the European Space Agency discovered that lichens can survive unprotected in space. So they put two species of lichen in a capsule and launched in a rocket back in 2005. Once they were in orbit, they exposed the lichens directly to the vacuum of space uh, with its wildly fluctuating temperatures and cosmic radiation. And then after 15 days of being in space, the lichens were brought back to Earth and found to be unchanged in their abil ability to photosynthesize. 15 days in space is a really hardy little, little organism. All right, so what does it matter? Um, Lichens are very sensitive to environmental disturbances, and so if you're looking for a way to cheaply assess air pollution or ozone depletion or metal contamination, you can use lichens in some cases. They've also been used for making dyes, perfumes, traditional medicines. Um, they also become food for insects or larger animals, including uh, reindeer, for instance, eat lichens. Also, shout out for Gates of the Arctic, where we talked about caribou and reindeer, so lichens are one of the things that they uh, will consume also growing in Gates of the Arctic. They're also an important part of soil stabilization. So there's desert ecosystems um, like de desert ecosystems like White Sands um, can't have kind of vascular uh, plant seeds establish until there's a lichen crust over the sand to kind of help uh, hold it in place and then also retain some of the water. So that pioneer aspect of lichens is important not only because it, it um, kind of starts the process of, 
of plants or other organisms establishing themselves there but it's also for um, environments like a desert where how would you even plant a plant in something where it's just sand and the answer is a lichen can start to to give a little bit of structure to it so the real hero of all these different environments the lichen all right so we are coming this area right here is called paradise and you can see there's a road that winds up here and there's a visitor center right up in the hills up here you can kind of see so this is a beautiful place uh, when i go and visit mount rainier uh, one day this is where i want to go so let me show a mountain picture. So this is what it looks like. And in Paradise, there is the Paradise Inn, which looks like this on the outside, but on the inside, it looks like that. It's a beautiful park. And you'll see it in the, in the video at the end too. They'll, they'll talk a little bit more about Paradise. The other one that I'll point out real quick, because we're sort of uh, along where that part of the park goes, is the Wonderland Trail. So the Wonderland Trail is a trail that, that goes around the entire park and it looks kind of like this. So you can see it's just a thin trail, but it has these views of all different sides of the, of the mountain. Um, actually, the spiral pattern of the flight plan was inspired by the Wonderland Trail because that kind of idea of just circling around it seemed like a very, a very great, uh, uh, a great and pretty way to, to see the park. Flip back here so you can see it again. Get these peaks and there's little um, excuse me little uh, rivers and lakes everywhere around here lots of glaciers and glaciation all right so in summary a lichen is a simple community of at least two mutually dependent organisms fungi and green alga uh, there are three basic types one leaf-like one with 3d structure and one that adheres tightly to whatever uh, surface it's on they're found over an incredible range and can live a very long time they're masters of survival, and they're able to grow in many types of environments and surfaces, including surviving in space. Uh, all of this talk of hardy animals really got my brain going. Like, I know I'm an animal who prefers warm and temperature-controlled environments. But maybe there's something I can learn from the lichens and their hardiness, you know? And actually, I think there is, you know? It's um, just like how the green algae can't survive without its fungus filaments for protection, I just need to find my own fungus filaments, you know? Something to add that kind of extra layer for when I go outside. Of course, as I was thinking this through, the first step of that plan would be getting the wife on board. And I just can't really imagine like, you know, hey, uh, I'm adopting this fungus and it's moving in with us. I don't see that going very well. You know, honey, <laughs> I liken you too much for that. <laughs> yeah, that was a setup for a pun. It's fine. Um, I, I, I assume you guys are all giggling because you all seem like fungi. That was a bad pun, but there's another one for you. I heard her snicker. <laughs> yeah. Um, it was pretty funny when I was walking around earlier and I'm like, let me show you the first topic. And I lean over and just, I'm pointing at a random rock in the neighbor's yard. It's like, you're talking about rocks? What's going on? So anyway. Okay, um, so with that, we will leave lichens behind. I hope you learned a little bit. They uh, they certainly impressed me. A fun topic. Uh, fractals, do you mind posting up the next poll here for our second topic? And so our second topic today is floods. And the reason I wanted to do floods is that there was a big flood in Mount Rainier back in 2006 that damaged the Carbon River Road. And Carbon River is actually... Uh, coming up, we're going to be up there just a little bit here. So I'll point it out when we pass over. So um, that damage that occurred and the flooding of a mountain and a glaciated mountain like this. There you see that river is beautiful. I'm actually going to fast forward a little bit in time here so we can get a little bit better sun. Tell you what we'll do. I took a photo that got... Um, featured on the Microsoft Flight Simulator Instagram, which was actually really flattering. Um, and it was along this flight path, so we can do a mini recreation of it here. Just the golden hour setting. All right. We also are passing over, we just passed over just back here a little bit, a place called um, Bench Lake. It's kind of a random lake I just picked because I, 
I wanted to show at least one of the lakes, but a lot of these lakes have these sort of tucked off in the mountains, beautiful kind of look to them. Um, so when you go and visit, make sure to check out some of the lakes around. I'll show up uh, another lake a little bit later. I'm also going to pop in and um, bring this throttle back a little bit. We are cruising along our flight plan. Okay. So floods, thank you fractals. So what is aggradation? Is it an increase in land elevation due to the uh, de uh, deposition, deposition of sediment? It's funny, I practice all the words that I know I don't know, but then every now and then I come across one I've just never, never said out loud. I heard someone say once that you should never make fun of someone for mispronouncing, mispronouncing, for mispronouncing a word um, because it means they probably learned it from reading. So I think about that a lot. I don't know if it actually helps or not when I mispronounce mispronunciating, um, but, uh, but it's a nice sentiment. Anyway, okay, so is it an increase in land elevation due to de uh, deposition of sediment, or is it the opposite of erosion, or all of the above? Sort of the opposite of erosion. So connection back to the park. So I mentioned they had that flood in 2006. Let me pull up a video, actually. Look at what the, like an anatomy of a flood is what they called this video. That was a really good overview of the topic. And we've been missing our, our friendly ranger, right? Let me know about those volumes. What is a flood? A flood is just too much water in the wrong place. The bigger question is why? Why does too much water end up in the wrong place? The factors that determine whether or not a place will flood are the same no matter where you are. Knowing the components of a flood can also help predict how often and how big or damaging those floods will be when they do occur. The Carbon River area in the northwest corner of Mount Rainier National Park is notoriously prone to flooding. A flood occurs when there is too much water flowing in a particular place. So what is it about the Carbon River that causes it to flood so frequently? Different places can handle different amounts of water, and the Carbon River area deals with a lot. On average, the area gets over 80 inches of precipitation a year. When moisture-laden air from the Pacific Ocean collides with the massive slopes of Mount Rainier, the result is lots of rain, or at higher elevations, snow. As a result of the frequent rain, the Carbon River area is home to a dense, temperate rainforest. Old growth trees, mosses, ferns, and numerous other plants thrive on the high amounts of rainfall. Some of the moisture falls as snow and becomes trapped as part of the Carbon Glacier. Excess water collects in numerous creeks and streams in the area, all eventually flowing into the powerful Carbon River. Even under normal conditions, the Carbon River can handle a lot of water. However, even places with a large capacity for water, like the Carbon River area, have a limit. During the November 2006 flood, the largest flood in the park's recorded history, it rained 18 inches in three days. The Carbon River area normally handles only 17 inches of rain in the entire month of November. Many factors affect whether or not a place like Carbon River can adapt to extreme amounts of rainfall, like what fell during November of 2006. The Carbon River is a large river capable of transporting a lot of water. Lush forests divert some rainfall, while glaciers store even more water as ice. However, frequent rain can also saturate soils and waterlog even the densest forest. Changing climate is affecting weather patterns, creating larger storms with more intense rainfall than in the past. A process called aggradation is also restricting the ability of the Carbon River to carry water. Aggradation is the opposite of erosion. 
Mount Rainier's glaciers create so much rocky material and sediment as they grind down the mountain that the rivers can't move at all. Plus, as climate change melts glaciers faster than ever, even more rocky material enters the river. When the river channels fill up, the river is forced in new directions, creating braiding of the river channels. Even under normal circumstances, aggradation can cause rivers to dramatically alter course. During flood events, the process of aggradation is accelerated, amplifying the effects of too much water in the system. Often, rivers end up flowing through surrounding forests as well as any human construction in the way. Floods are a natural and often necessary part of a healthy environment. Sediments deposited by floodwaters provide much needed nutrients for new vegetation. The powerful force of the water scours riverbeds of debris and creates new habitat for fish and aquatic insects. Floods are also very damaging, particularly to human roads and structures. Unfortunately, the Carbon River Road was built along the edge of the Carbon River. When aggradation fills up the river channels, the easiest path for the water is often the road itself. This conflict with human use has played out repeatedly throughout the road's history. As long as the conditions that cause flooding persist, then floods will continue to happen in the Carbon River area. Glaciers are shrinking due to climate change, releasing more water and rocky material into the river system. The process of aggradation is accelerating. Rain will continue to fall. Human use, however, is within our control. By better understanding the anatomy of floods, Mount Rainier National Park plans for the future so that a balance can be struck that allows for the natural processes of the river as well as for human use. Kind of interesting, right? It's the, the way to think of floods as, as just a, a natural thing to be understood and, and to work with um, instead of the, the approach where they were, what, just rebuilding the road every two or three years. Uh, not quite as effective. Hey there, Flying Singer and ASU Sun Devil. I see you uh, way off in the back there. Hopefully exploring a little bit more of the park. Uh, so basically, we're going to be flying over uh, downtown Seattle um, and then uh, kind of getting the view of what the mountain looks like from downtown Seattle. So this is sort of a, an intentional sunrise uh, exit here. All right. Straw poll results. Yeah, Fractals, I think this, the poll is broken because I voted myself earlier and it just showed up as nothing. So... Um, everyone gets a star today. Uh, the answer is all of the above. So it is both the increase in land elevation due to the deposition of uh, sediment, and it's kind of the opposite of erosion. That's what they call it in the video, at least. I don't super like the description as opposite of erosion, but it's kind of a useful way to think about it. So, all right. So floods in general. Um, I don't need to show pictures of floods. You all know what floods are, and that's not that's not really the point. It, what it does is it's an overflow of water that submerges land that is usually dry. That's all there is to it. They're considered second only to wildfires as the most common natural disaster on Earth. So a lot of different ways it can occur. We'll talk about some of the common ones in a second. It can also, um, it, uh, floods often cause damage to homes and businesses if they're located on the natural floodplain. You might remember when we talked about uh, in... Um, Gateway Arch National Park, we talked about how rivers meander over time and carve out that floodplain. So anything that's built along that floodplain um, is liable for a flood. The tricky piece, though, is people have traditionally lived and worked along rivers because it's a good source of easy transportation, it's a good source of rich, uh, fertile land to work in. And so you have this sort of um, back and forth you have to deal with of, well, we want to live near the river, but it's also dangerous because of, of flooding, and what are we going to do about that? So there's a couple different standards kinds of floods that you come across. These categories aren't great, um, but they're useful as ideas. So take them with a grain of salt. It's not official or anything. Um, at least as far as I can tell, it wasn't official. It really focuses around the source of the flood. So you can get an aerial flood where the water is, poured, is supplied by rainfall or snowmelt. You can get a uh, uh, river, uh, river, river iron, river iron, excuse me, um, or a channel flood, which is just if the river overflows because of an influx of water. You can get an estuary or a coastal flood, and this is commonly a combination of storm surges. 
of blowing winds. And you can get urban flooding, which can have a lot of sources, but is distinct from everything else because it's usually a overflowing of the drainage system. Um, so when you see, well, yeah, I have a picture of that one actually, but it's kind of kind of gnarly, so I'll blow it up. Um, let me, yeah, okay. So that's sort of like the different kinds of floods. You get from the rain falling from the sky, uh, influx of water in a river, uh, storm surges along the coast or estuaries, and then um, human creation. Uh, in something going wrong with the, the water system. The flip side of that, especially that's weird with this park, is that aggradation, right? And so my favorite visual explanation of aggradation... And, uh, okay, so... the My favorite picture of aggradation is, is kind of silly, but it's... um. I just think it's funny that they put this house here and then their way of explaining how it accumulates is just over time sediment gets added and then the house is suddenly buried. Um, but that's the basic idea is like you have your river and then over time as it accumulates you'll notice that there's less of a channel for it to work with and so that's where you might get a flood. Yeah, it occurs in places where there's more sediment uh, than can be transported out of the system so you get it at river deltas a lot, that sort of, um, sort of thing. The reason Mount Rainier aggradates is the, um, aggrades, excuse me, is what it's called, not aggradate, not aggradates, aggrades and aggradation, um, is instead of the river eroding, like the Colorado River of the Grand Canyon, it's the rocks that are coming off the glaciers. Um, okay, so the pattern of aggradation is also something that is very helpful for building theories. And so this is one of the ways that they were able to deduce that there's likely water on Mars because they saw aggradation patterns. So this is a, uh, a picture of Mars and then the aggradation that they're looking at is off in the distance here. Kind of a cool, cool way to apply that same sort of phenomena you see at Earth. And then you can say, well, there probably was water here at one point, so. All right, so in summary, a flood is an overflow of water. It submerges land that's usually dry. It's the second most frequent natural disaster, natural disaster, and because people often live along rivers, it can be it can have a big impact on areas where it occurs. Aggradation is something that's common at Mount Rainier and other places uh, similar because of the glacial melts, and that can add more rocks to the riverbed, which means less space for the water and more likelihood of floods. Uh, okay, so <laughs> this is a bad joke, but I'm gonna go for it anyway. Um, so I know it's been a while since we've been to social gatherings, and so I thought we could recap how civilized people interact, and it's related to blood floods, I promise. So first, your friend approaches you, right? Arms outstretched, going in for a hug. But you notice there's a bottle of water in one of their hands. As they approach, they shout, flood awareness, and they attempt to dump the water on your head. Now you may remember these sorts of shenanigans from pre-COVID world, uh, where people are always coming up to you and dumping water on your head. I know, it was tough. Well, now you're leaving COVID with a new technique to counter this sort of behavior. What you need to do is, as they start to pour the water, grab their hand, push it back, and yell, Aggradation! Obviously, playground rules apply, so you've officially won that encounter after you shout, Aggradation. You're welcome. All right. Thanks, Fractals, for, for posting up the... Uh, the links there. So like I mentioned, there's a video of the park. Um, it's about a, a 12 minute long video. The seven minutes or so would be about where I would stop uh, normally. Since we're going to go a couple minutes over, I'll just let it play through the whole thing. Um, and uh, and we'll close out here. And then I'll have the, the stream feel free to drop off whenever it'll just be the end of the, the video all the way through. With that then, Fractals, do you mind posting up the, uh, the parks for next week? And we'll do a little sign off before I put the video up. Also, thank you. Surfactals posted the survey. Uh, I always appreciate the feedback. Thank you for that. Uh, Discord for community if you want to come hang out. Uh, it's always a blast. And then uh, follow on Twitter for notifications of, of upcoming things. So today we talked about uh, Mount Rainier National Park, we talked about William McKinley, we talked about lichens, we talked about floods. Uh, Fractals just posted up that uh, survey. I always appreciate that. And uh, Oh, right. Uh, people can't vote because we don't have the voting software working today. Um, so feel free to post directly in the chat which park you'd like to go to. Uh, and then uh, Fractals will tally them up and or just choose the one that he's most inclined to go to. Um, you never know with Fractals. And we'll let that, um, we'll make that decision in just a second. So with that, thank you for being my co-pilot today. 
And until we meet again, stay curious and keep on exploring. And, okay, we got one for Crater Lake. Welcome, ASU Sun Devil. Crater Lake, Crater Lake, okay. <laughs> that sounds like an overwhelming Crater Lake. Pinnacles, okay. Got one for Pinnacles and uh, five for Crater Lake. So uh, why don't we do that then? For next week, we will do, uh, we'll go explore Crater Lake National Park. Should be a blast. That'll be a, a very fun flight. All right, like I said, I'll play this uh, video. It's going to go a little bit afterwards. Um, feel free to stay around for the whole time if you'd like. If you want to drop off beforehand, um, I won't be offended. Uh, all right. And I will see you all. No, oh, yeah, fractals. <laughs> Fractal saying nobody wants Crater Lake. We're going to Black Canyon of the Gunson. Yeah. Um, a fascinating park, by the way. We will get there one of these days. All right, like I said, so I'll play up the, um, the video of the park. It's about... 12 minutes long, it's a little bit longer. Um, it's very interesting and really good footage. So, thanks again, everyone. See you all next week. Welcome to Mount Rainier National Park, covering almost 370 square miles. The park is home to not only iconic Mount Rainier, but thousands of acres of pristine wilderness made up of everything from subalpine meadows and old growth forests to glacier carved valleys and volcanic peak. Whether you have a day or all summer to explore, every corner of the park has something amazing to discover. We begin our exploration in the northwest corner of the park, home to the Carbon River and Mowich Lake. Carbon River is one of the best areas in the park to see the dynamic effects of water in shaping Mount Rainier. From the Carbon Glacier, the longest, deepest, and lowest elevation glacier in the park, to the Carbon River itself, water is a powerful sculpting force that continually changes this landscape. As one of the rainiest places in the park, the Carbon River area is home to a temperate rainforest. Learn about the plants and animals of this rainforest by following the easy, self-guided rainforest nature trail that begins near the Carbon River entrance. In 2006, massive flood damaged much of the historic Carbon River Road. Now the road is closed to vehicles, but is open for bike riding and hiking. Pristine Mowich Lake, located not far from Carbon River, is open from July to October. A starting point for several popular hiking trails, Mowich Lake also has a backcountry campground. The Nisqually entrance is located in the southwest corner of the park and serves as the historic gateway to the Longmire and Paradise areas of the park. West Side Road, a popular access point for hiking, branches off the main road not far from the entrance. Like the Carbon River Road, West Side Road has been shaped many times by flooding and debris flows. Evidence of these dynamic processes can be seen clearly along the road. As you continue the drive up to Longmire, pause at Couts Creek for one of the first views of the mountain visible in the park along this road. Or a little farther, walk the short Twin Firs Loop Trail for an introduction to the park's old growth forest. Longmire was the first settlement in the park and is preserved as a National Historic Landmark District. The story of the park's early history can still be found along the Trail of the Shadows and the historic walking tour through Longmire. Volcanic mineral springs that supported the early Longmire settlement still bubble in the Longmire Meadow. The road itself from the Squally entrance up to Paradise is also part of the historic landmark district. Designed specifically to provide the best experience for visitors, 
the winding road dramatically reveals the mountain and its terrain, from glacier-carved valleys and lava ridges to waterfalls and old-growth forest. Favorite stops between Longmire and Paradise include Christine and Narada Falls, or you can camp at Cougar Rock Campground. Many trails can be accessed from the road, with options to hike along glacial rivers and lava ridges, or to explore subalpine meadows. Paradise, well deserving of its name, is the most popular destination in the park. Home to the Paradise Inn and the Jackson Visitor Center, this area has many amenities for the first-time visitor. In winter, the area remains open for snowshoeing, sledding, and other winter activities. In summer and fall, hike through subalpine meadows thick with wildflowers or fall foliage. As you leave Paradise, enjoy a drive down the Paradise Valley Road, a favorite route for viewing spring wildflowers or fall colors. Keep an eye out for birds, marmots, deer, bears, and other wildlife enjoying the valley. The historic Stevens Canyon Road descends from the subalpine meadows at Paradise to the heart of the old growth forest found in the Ohanapakash area of the park. Like Paradise Valley Road, Stevens Canyon Road is a popular drive for viewing fall colors as well as ephemeral waterfalls in spring. As you drive along the canyon, don't forget to stop at some of the pullouts and look back for a magnificent view of Mount Rainier or make a day of it and hike one of the many trails along Stevens Canyon. Explore subalpine lakes, such as Bench and Snow Lakes or Louise Lake. Hike the Pinnacle Peak Trail in the Tatouche Mountains, or follow part of the 93-mile Wonderland Trail that circles Mount Rainier. At Box Canyon, look over the side of an old stone bridge to view a deep, narrow fissure eroded in the rock by the muddy fork of the Cowlitz River before continuing on to the Grove of the Patriarchs. The ancient trees that make up the grove reside on an island in the middle of the clear, snow-fed Ohanapakash River. With trees hundreds of years old, the Grove of the Patriarchs epitomizes the feeling of age and majesty associated with true old growth forest. Those looking to enjoy a longer hike through the area's old growth forest can take the East Side Trail, which branches off from the Grove of the Patriarchs Trail. At Ohanapakash, stop in the visitor center before exploring the Hot Springs Nature Trail. Camp beneath the canopy of the forest in the Ohanapakash campground, or follow the trail leaving the campground to view the impressive Silver Falls. Head north from Ohanapakash to reach the White River and Sunrise areas in the northeast corner of the park. Climbing up through forested valleys to mountain passes, the road north has many pullouts with spectacular views of the surrounding areas. 
trails along the way lead to a historic fire lookout and connect to the famous Pacific Crest Trail, which crosses through the east side of the park. At Chinook Pass, walk across the historic Entrance Arch Walking Bridge, or enjoy the lush wildflower displays that fill the subalpine meadows ringing Tipsu Lake. third campground and provides access to some of the park's east side trails such as Summerland and Owyhee Lakes. A favorite hike is the Emmons Moraine Trail, offering amazing views of the Emmons Glacier and Mount Rainier. The road from White River up to Sunrise is a journey through the geologic history of Mount Rainier. Starting in the White River Valley carved by Ice Age glaciers and shaped by volcanic mud flows, the Sunrise Road climbs past layers of lava and ash from past eruptions to reach the lava ridge upon which Sunrise is built. Sunrise Point features 360 degree views of not only Mount Rainier, but the surrounding Cascade Mountains. On clear days, you can see the volcanic peaks of Mount Adams and Mount Baker in the distance. Combined with the amazing views of the Emmons Glacier and Mount Rainier, Sunrise is another popular summer destination in the park. The Sunrise area is open from July to September. Located on the drier east side of Mount Rainier, subalpine meadows around Sunrise have a different character than areas that receive more rainfall, like Paradise. Hiking opportunities abound with trails leading through subalpine meadows and along volcanic ridges. Where will your next Mount Rainier adventure take you? Will you stand at the foot of a glacier, gaze up at an ancient forest canopy, or surround yourself with wildflowers? Will you hike to a waterfall or relax next to a subalpine lake? Or will you stay for a while to enjoy the view? Plan your visit to Mount Rainier National Park by visiting the park website. All right. Thank you all very much. See you all next week.